Good morning. Thank you all for being here, especially on a Saturday. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Danny, thank you for the idea and making this possible. And Rafe, thanks so much for your help in planning everything. Um, we decided that I would give the definition of differential privacy, freeing the other speakers to concentrate on their specific topics. And this definition is um, 10 years old, and this presentation of the definition reflects 10 years of evolution in how to explain what's going on. Because from the formula itself, it's not quite so clear. One of our speakers today is Helen Nissenbaum, and in fact, um, I got interested in working on privacy in general because of conversations that I had with Helen in about 2000 or 2001. And I was looking for some, because of my discussions with Helen, I was looking for some piece of the privacy problem in general that we might be able to sort of tame with mathematical rigor. And we settled on, I settled on uh, privacy preserving data analysis. So, the driving application or example that uh, I had in mind, I was talking this over with my then intern, Adam Smith, was um, the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau has the data of the people. It is being analyzed for the benefit of the people to apportion the people's resources, and there is a legal mandate for privacy. So how can you analyze data while preserving privacy was the general topic. But you know, of course, it goes way beyond census. You could use it for epidemic detection based on over-the-counter uh, drug purchases. You'd like to keep the individual purchases private, but you'd like to see that there's an epidemic happening. Uh, analysis of loan application data for evidence of systematic discrimination and so on. And this question of how to analyze data while preserving privacy is a very old question. It's at least 50 years old uh, in the literature. So one thing that many people think of is, well, just de-identify the data. So that means you start with some kind of original database, you pass it through some kind of mechanism or machine M, you reveal, maybe you delete some outliers and some fields, and you release some kind of de-identified data set, and you say to the data analyst, have at it, find anything you want, just look at this de-identified data. And the only thing that we're gonna say about that is that de-identified data isn't. Either it isn't data or it isn't de-identified. So we're just not going there. And I can point you to many places to, uh, to back up this statement. So the next idea is, well, you want to do statistical analysis of data, so just release the statistics. So in our imagination, we have our data analyst. She asks a question. She asks for the number or the fraction of people that are over six feet tall and like donuts or things like that. She gets an answer. She asks another question. She gets an answer. And that's going to be our general model of how a data analyst who can't see raw data because that would be privacy disc uh, disclosive, and who can't see even de-identify data because that doesn't work. So she has to interact with the data set by asking questions. So what if we just give her statistics? And your intuition says, hey, a statistic is, it's not going to be dramatically affected by the data of any individual. That's the whole point of a statistic. It's like you take you know, you compute some quantity from a sample, and it shouldn't really matter which your sample is. Otherwise, it isn't a very interesting statistic. It isn't an interesting measure of your population as a whole. So, to make a long story short, there's a whole host of results that um, have now become known collectively as the fundamental law of information reconstruction. And they say, roughly speaking, that overly accurate estimates of too many statistics completely destroys privacy. And this will, in fact, be the uh, subject, uh, will be touched on um, he rather heavily, actually, by Jonathan Ullman in his talk, Dusting for Fingerprints. So Latanya Sweeney, who is a master de-identifier, uh, when she was the uh, head of the, the CTO of the Federal Trade Co Commission, said, computer science got us into this mess. Can computer science get us out of it? 
So with that in mind, how can we define what it is that we're trying to do? How can we define privacy for the purposes of privacy preserving data analysis? So here's a data set. Helen Nissenbaum is in the data set. The question is, what kind of privacy, what kind of guarantee do we want to make to Helen? So the first thing that you would try, and in fact, this intuition dates back in the statistics literature, at least to uh, Tordelinius in 1977, says that the data analyst, by interacting with the data set, shouldn't be able to learn anything new about Nissenbaum that the analyst didn't know before having access to this data set. So Helen may have a website where she has all kinds of information about herself. Anybody can know those things because she's posted them. And the fact that somebody would know them is certainly something you can't blame on this statistical database because Helen posted them. But maybe you want to say that we shouldn't learn anything new about Helen that she didn't post about herself. And the problem with this definition is basically, what is the point? So we do statistical analysis of data because we want to learn something about the population. Let's suppose that I'm from Mars and I believe that all humans have two left feet. So in particular, I think that Nissenbaum has two left feet. And I analyze the data set and I learned that almost all humans have one left foot and one right foot. So my beliefs about Helen have changed. I now think she has one left foot and one right foot. I learned something new about her. And the question is, did I compromise her privacy or not? Now, that's a definitional choice that we make. Do we want to call this a privacy compromise? We learned something new about her. So we took the position that, no, this is not a privacy compromise. And the reason is, we would have learned the same things if Helen had been replaced by another random member of the population. We didn't learn about Helen. We learned about people. So with this approach, we disentangle learning about the population as a whole from learning about the individuals who are in the data set. Now, this does not say that learning about the population as a whole can never hurt an individual. For example, uh, actually, let me wait on that for a second, okay? But we're, it's not, we're, we're not saying that we haven't learned something that, that, that can be used against them, and you'll see an example in a minute. But the English language definition of differential privacy says that the outcome of any analysis is essentially equally likely, independent of whether any individual joins or refrains from joining the data set. So we'll learn essentially the same things with essentially the same probabilities. If Nissenbaum goes away, if Sweeney joins, if Nissenbaum is replaced by Sweeney, and other small changes to the data set. Now, as I said, differential privacy separates the harms that can come from the teachings of the database from the harms that can come from participation. So suppose the data set teaches us that smoking causes cancer, and it's known that somebody smokes. This person's insurance premiums may rise. They've been harmed by the teachings of the data set. But they would be harmed in this way and the premiums would rise independent of whether that particular smoker is in the data set or out of the data set. And learning that smoking causes cancer is the whole point of statistical data analysis. And in fact, the smoker can also be helped because having learned this, the smoker can now choose to join a smoking cessation program, maybe you know, inspired to join a, pro a smoking cessation program. So here's the formal definition of differential privacy. First of all, we need the concept of, of um, data sets that differ in the data of one person, adjacent data sets. So adjacent data sets are data sets that are almost identical, but one is slightly smaller than the other, and the larger one contains the data of just one more person. So for example, 
the data of everybody in this room and the data of everybody in this room except Nissenbaum. Those are two adjacent or neighboring data sets. Uh, our algorithms that will analyze data sets will flip coins. They'll be randomized algorithms. And there is a parameter, epsilon, whose role you'll see in a second. So our algorithm, or mechanism, M, gives epsilon differential privacy if for all pairs of data sets, X and Y, that differ in the data of just one person, so the data with Helen and without Helen, and every possible output event S, the probability that we see S when the data set is X is almost the same as, it's at most E to the epsilon times the probability that we see S when the data set is Y. So the ratio of those two probabilities is at most E to the epsilon. And the probability space is over the coin flips of the algorithm. The algorithm is the good guy. So arbitrary data sets, the algorithm is the good guy. And because we said for all pairs of data sets, the same inequality would hold if we swapped the roles of X and Y. So this is um, a definition that was uh, put forward by, uh, together with McSherry, Nisim, and Smith in 2006. So as you know, e to the epsilon, when epsilon is small, is about one plus epsilon. And this is a nice way to read this. So when epsilon is zero, it says that these two probabilities have to be the same. So when you have zero probability loss, you also get zero information about the data set by, by some kind of composition there. Uh, but um, when epsilon is small, this could be a, a very reasonable notion. And the key point is that if a bad event is very unlikely when I'm not in the data set, then it will still be very unlikely when I am in the data set. So, for example, if I'm going to be charged higher premiums when I'm, sorry, <laughs> I shouldn't have used that example. If I'm going to be uh, identified as a member of a genome-wide association study case group when, um, uh, I can't be identified as a member of a genome-wide association study when I'm not actually in the study. Therefore, if I am in the study, then still I will be very unlikely, in fact, zero probability of being identified as a member of the, of the case group. So epsilon is our measure of privacy loss. Now, uh, there are some properties of differentially private algorithms that flow directly from the definition, independent of the actual implementation of the actual algorithm that's achieving differential privacy. First of all, differentially private algorithms are future-proof. Privacy comes from the process by which the outputs are generated. And if a data release is differential, differentially private, that ratio of probabilities doesn't change if somebody who sees the output goes off and uh, learns other auxiliary information or um, sees other data sets that will exist, not even not now, but in the future. Um, if an algorithm yields epsilon differential privacy for a single individual, then it automatically yields k epsilon differential privacy for groups of size k. So if you're happy with epsilon differential privacy for you and you have a family of size five, you'll see that your family has privacy of five epsilon, and you can decide how you feel about that. Most importantly is that we can understand the behavior of privacy loss, of differential privacy under composition. That is to say, we can bound the cumulative privacy loss over multiple analyses. In other, uh, one crude bound shows us that, in the worst case, the epsilons add up. We can do better than that, and that will be the subject of uh, Guy Rothblum's talk, who's going to talk about composition. Because of the composition property, which says that we can understand when we ask about many different statistics, we get that differentially private algorithms are actually programmable. That is to say, in ordinary programming, you, you don't just compute everything 
from ands and ors, even though you guys probably know that anything that you can compute can be computed just using ands and ors. What we do is we build little subroutines and, 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 and algorithms for smaller problems, and the whole field of algorithm design is the creative and um, uh, intelligent combination of different computational building blocks to carry out a sophisticated com uh, computational task while minimizing some sorts of resources like time or space. And the same thing is true with differential privacy. You can take small differentially private building blocks and combine them to carry out complex differentially private data analyses. And that is a power that none of the other approaches have, as far as I know. And that is uh, going to be the subject of Kunal Talwar's talk. Um, so I've said that overly accurate estimates of too many statistics compromises privacy. So differential privacy has to somehow blur your answers a little bit. And so you have sort of truth and you have the blurred version of truth. And well, which one is really telling you what's going on? It's very arguable that the blurred version is really telling you about the whole story. It's a kind of generalizability you're allowed, and, and, and in fact, differentially private analyses do generalize. Things that you learn in a differentially private way do generalize to the population from which your data set was drawn. And that, combined with the post-processing properties and the composition properties, will um, allow us to do things to ensure statistical validity of exploratory data analyses, which is something that there is no other general technique to do. Differentially, private algorithms will do this for you, and so it's a use of privacy that is com privacy technology even when privacy itself is not a concern. And that's going to be the subject of Kunal Talwar's talk. And. Um, that's uh, what I had prepared for the definition. What I should have mentioned is that uh, Helen Nissenbaum's talk will uh, address some of the problems of the fact that differential privacy does let you learn things about the population of a whole that, as a whole that could be harmful, and what should we make of that? Okay, thank you. <laughs>